Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Brandon Gossett. I'm with the Nystrand Center of Excellence in Education. Uh, you're joining us for another of our speaker series. Uh, we've got uh, quite a lineup for you this, this evening and uh, looking forward to our conversation uh, with our panelists. And uh, so we'll jump into that in just a second. So thank you for your time. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce our moderator for the discussion, um, Dr. Geneva Stark. Uh, Dr. Stark is the director of the Nystrand Center of Excellence in Education. Uh, she's also a clinical professor uh, in the Education Leadership Evaluation and Organization Department here at the University of Louisville. Um, Dr. Stark is a native of New Orleans, Louisiana. Still not sure that I'm pronouncing that correct, Dr. Stark. I need to practice that. Um, and she resides here in Metro Louisville. She received her BS degree from Xavier in of New Orleans and her master's in education from the University of New Orleans. Uh, she receives her, received her doctor of philosophy from University of Louisville and also has a national professional certification in diversity and inclusion. Uh, in fact, if you've heard her name before, it's probably in one of those capacities um, in, the, in the conversations around DEI. Uh, Dr. Stark retired from Jefferson County Public Schools after 25 plus years of administrative service. Uh, she served as a teacher, assistant principal, and then principal at Western High School. And she became the first and only African-American to serve as president of Kentucky Association of Secondary School Principals. Uh, she later moved to JCPS Human Resources and served in a variety of roles there. And she's also served as district administrator in diversity, equity, and poverty department there. Uh, she's one of four educators recently selected to participate in the Minority Superintendent Fellowship Program and has worked collaboratively with various departments on professional development for the Jefferson County Public Schools uh, regarding their racial equity policy uh, and implicit bias. She's actively involved in local, regional, and national organizations that are dedicated to diversity, equity, inclusion, and sense of belonging. And she serves as diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant at the local, state, national, and international levels. She, uh, if that's not enough, she serves as the treasurer on the board of directors of the National Alliance of Black School Educators and as a member of the Louisville League of Women Voters and the National Council of Negro Women. Uh, as I like to say, I don't think Dr. Stark sleeps. Uh, she has served as a mentor to students, teachers, support staff, and administrators locally, statewide, and nationally. So uh, thank you, Dr. Stark, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Brandon, uh, for the introduction. But I'd also like to thank our other two members of the Nystrand Center, who does a great job in making sure the Nystrand Signature Series happen, and as Denise Dadisman and Patricia Noel. And again, welcome to the third installment of the Nystrand Center Speaker Series. Um, and today's topic is UVL Recruitment, Addressing the Education Shortage. And <clears throat> we know that uh, before the pandemic, there was a decline in education. Um, for people looking at education as a career. And since the pandemic, um, it's been a mass exit of individuals leaving the education system, not only teachers, but also assistant principals, principals, instruction assistants, assistant superintendents, superintendents, and, and even in higher ed, people are leaving. So the goal and the question becomes, we know that education is the basic foundation of who we are. And also as we progress and the success that we have in life, is usually based on our education. So it is not something that we can turn a, a, a blind eye to because we know that we have to address the education shortage. And UofL is doing an amazing job in trying to look at why UofL, you know, and the things that they are doing to try to bridge that gap or to get individuals to look at education. So today we have, um, again, a, a great panel um, across the board to be able to talk about what is happening at the University of Louisville. And we have our first, you know, well, we have five panelists and we have uh, Dr. Dylan Nager, who is the Assistant Dean of student, uh, Undergraduate Student Success and Enrollment. We have Dr. Amy Sealy Flint, who is over elementary and secondary education, the chair of that department. We also have Dr. Justin Cooper, who's the chair of early childhood you know, and special education. We have Dr. Stephanie Wooten Burnett, who's in charge of alternative certification programs that includes the Louisville Teacher Residency Program. And we also have Dr. Debbie Powers, 
you know, who is the program director of ed education leadership department. And so we're going to talk, we'll have a discussion about how do we move forward and some of the things that's happening at the University of Louisville. So again, welcome um, to uh, our third installment. And again, the theme is UVL recruitment addressing the education shortage. And so my first question is to Dr. Dillon. Talk about what are we doing at UVL to address the shortages and what systems do we have in place? Thank you, uh, I appreciate this opportunity. So as you alluded to, um, the field of education is one that is taking a lot of hits in the media um, and it's one that we're having to try to repaint the narrative and get people to understand that it is a great career to go into education and to be a teacher. Um, everyone on this call at some point, I think, has worked in the field of K-12. Um, it's a job that I love, um, and it's a job that I try to sell to prospective students each and every day when I meet with them. So to uh, to answer the question, what U of L is doing, it's rewriting that narrative and trying to give that personal one-on-one -on -one attention to our prospective students. To, like, as you said, why U of L? It's the one-on-one -on -one attention. It's the uh, training that they're going to receive and the preparation to get them to feel confident as they walk out into the workforce. And Dr. Dillon. Um... Please um, give a brief history to the audience of who is Dr. Dylan Nager and also your history in education. Sure. Um, so I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I was a K-12 educator in the school systems in St. Louis um, before I decided that I wanted to go into the higher ed route. So I taught K-12 systems. I taught every grade level K, kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, and then transition to higher education. And I've been at Louisville now since 2005 in a full-time capacity. Um, had the pleasure of working in various roles. Uh, the department that I've spent most of my time is health and sports sciences, which from an educator prep standpoint, we uh, educate students who are gonna be health and physical education teachers. But I also had the pleasure of teaching our exercise science, or exercise physiology, and our sport administration students as well. Um, so I have been at Louisville since 2005, and it's been a blessing and an honor. And I'm proud to be here. Thank you very much. And for the rest of the panel, just um, I want you to give a two or three minute introduction of who are you. And we're going to begin with Dr. Amy Sealy Flint. Well, the next person will be Dr. Amy Sealy Flint. Well, good afternoon. And like Dylan, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about UofL and teacher education in particular. Um, I'm a former uh, elementary school teacher. I taught in Los Angeles and in Atlanta, Georgia. I've lived a lot of different places and I've taught a lot of different grades. And each year when August rolls around, I'm wondering where my kids are. So I love the classroom and have been very fortunate to have a position where it allows me to work with pre-service teachers and in-service teachers and children and think about the future of education. Um, I currently am the chair and professor in the elementary, middle, secondary teacher ed program or department, and I specialize in early literacy. So Thank that's a, a brief, a brief history. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Dr. Justin Cooper. I would also like to thank you for this opportunity to, to speak today. Brief history on me. <clears throat> I believe I've been in special ed. I, I was trying to count up, which is not always a good thing. I, I think 32 years now in special education. Um, I've been a classroom teacher at the elementary and middle school level. I'm so old, we actually called it junior high when I, <laughs> when I started teaching. Um, uh, but I've been a special education teacher in Utah, in Wyoming, Florida. Um, also, I went to school for my master's degree at Southern Miss, University of Southern Mississippi, and did some research in schools in Mississippi, um, eventually coming to Kentucky. I've been in Kentucky now for uh, almost 25 years. I've been in Kentucky. So, um, but yeah, my background, I, I've been a special education teacher, primarily focusing on uh, students with emotional and behavioral disorders. 
um, eventually got interested in the research side of things and, and why we told teachers to do what they did. Um, I, I used to be a, a consumer of knowledge. I would People would tell me what to do and I would do it in the classroom, but I started to become interested in why we do those things. So that kind of took me on a trajectory into the research world and, and into higher education. So um, I've been, I was at Eastern Kentucky University for 11 years and I've been at Louisville for the past 11 years. Uh, as well. So um, that's kind of a, a quick, brief history about me. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Stephanie Wooten Burnett. I too want to thank you for this opportunity. I'm Stephanie Wooten Burnett, and I'm over the Alt Certain Residency Programs. Um, I'm a proud alum of the University of Louisville. Three of my four degrees are from U of L undergrad, master's, and my PhD. Um, I, like Dylan, I started out in HSS department, so my love is physical education and school health, and I taught that, um, taught in Oldham County, um, then I came back to U L for a little while, then I went on a quick sabbatical from U L and got a, another license or two for principalship and uh, superintendent in Indiana. And then I came back and I get to hang out with these fine folks and work with all the students in all the different departments to try to recruit and retain them and work in our community. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Debbie Powers. Well, like everyone else, thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. I am um, Debbie Powers. I'm a 37 year educator. Um, most of those years spent in public education. I was a middle school teacher for 17 of those years and then moved on to the high school setting. Um, I worked at the Kentucky Department of Education on what I call two different tours of duty there. Did, uh, did some different work there. Um, I've been at the University of Louisville. This is my second tour of duty here. I am a grad of the University of Louisville as well, our EDD program in, in the department in which I'm working currently. Um, I'm thrilled to be able to work in school leadership because I see school leaders as multipliers. We can all impact people in our classrooms, but when you're a leader, you multiply that impact um, just many times over. So I, I'm thrilled to be a part of the evening um, panel this evening, but also I love the work that we're doing and I think we're making an impact. So thank you again for having us. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. Dillon, we're gonna come back to you. Um, what resources and compensations are we using or, or have we decided to use to motivate or incentivize individuals to become educators? Well, I think uh, the first thing as a university that we're trying to do um, is show them the investment, obviously, that you said in resources. So the first thing a prospective student, what they're gonna be looking for is scholarships. Um, so that is one of the things we're really as a university trying to focus on um, is figure out ways to offer funding for prospective students to make it more feasible and affordable for them to pay for their a college education. Um, and then directly related to that is um, investment of resources once they're here. It's like any corporation, uh, you don't want to lose your good employees. And as an institution, we don't want to lose our good perspective uh, future educators. So it's finding ways to invest the resources, energy, and the infrastructure to make sure that they walk away with this positive experience. And I think one of the best ways the university is doing that is through our partnerships with area school corporations, um, making the, our students have great hands-on uh, experiences that it builds their resume, number one, but more importantly, it allows them to shadow and see uh, high quality educators out in the field. It's one thing, as Dr. Cooper alluded to, you can uh, learn the knowledge from a textbook, uh, but being actually out there and learning it from a research perspective for our students hands on, that really helps paint the picture for our students. Oh, thank you very much. And, and speaking of that, um, um, Dr. Amy Seeley Flint and um, Dr. Cooper, when we're talking about, again, the mass exit, um, 
are you familiar with the vacancies that exist in early elementary and secondary education and early childhood and special ed? And, and what are we doing to, uh, are we connecting with the districts to be able to see what the numbers are in those specific areas? And we can go with Dr. Flint, we can go with you first. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, we are aware of the vacancies. I think um, not only just in hearing it from the national and local news, but we have uh, ongoing conversations with all of our partner districts about their needs. Uh, and in particular around science, math, English language, English language learning and early childhood seem to be the the areas where there is the greatest need. And so we are having conversations with our partners, just trying to figure out what we can do. And one of the things I will say that I think the University of Louisville is doing very well is offering out a variety of pathways for folks to become teachers. So we have traditional programs, we have alternative programs, we have one year post back kind of programs. We have lots of pathways that people can find themselves uh, thinking about if they're interested in coming back to be a teacher. So yes, we are in constant conversation. Okay. Dr. Koopy, can you add anything to that? Or, and, and maybe like what's, you know, when you say school partners, um, can you maybe identify some of the districts we're working with? Because we are in an area where there are multiple school districts around us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll just add, we are painfully aware of the shortages. <laughs> um, we, we are in constant communication with multiple districts around. Um, I'm working with, just this week, I worked with um, Hardin County, for example. Um, and one thing that's, it, it, in special ed has always been an area of high need. I told you I've been in special ed now for 32 years. Uh, when I was doing my student teaching, I was, I was offered eight positions prior to me completing outside of the school that I was doing my student teaching in prior to me completing student teaching. It was high need then. I had people you know, knocking on my door. Very little has changed in special ed in that time. Um, the pandemic, of course, and, and the current state of things has exacerbated that. And so we're, we're seeing even more uh, troubling numbers you know, in terms of, of teachers, uh, highly qualified and certified teachers in those roles. Um, I, I, we talk to districts all the time. I'm in constant communication with JCPS, Hardin County, Shelby County, all the surrounding counties around here. But one of the things that I found most interesting is every summer I get calls from principals and superintendents uh, in, in the, the local schools. And what I noticed as the pandemic started is those calls started coming from further and further away. The radius outside of Louisville, mm -hmm. I started getting calls from districts in Ohio, Tennessee, Indiana, even got a call from a, a, a school system in Montana, things like that that never used to happen. Just begging, do you have any teachers that might be interested in, in an adventure and go move out west and teach somewhere completely different? So this is obviously you know, nationwide, but our, our primary objective is to fill our local schools and our surrounding school districts. And those are the ones that we work with you know, most frequently. Um, in terms of what we're doing, I think we're trying to do more at the undergraduate level in terms of recruitment and retention there. But I think what we're seeing is that our immediate pathway is to, to find more, more uh, ways to certify people at the graduate level. And I'm not going to get into, I won't, I won't cross over into Stephanie Wooten Burnett's area because she's going to have a lot to say about that. But many of the things that we're doing at that graduate level are partnering with her and her efforts within the district. And, and really it comes down to meeting the district needs. And, and they're very clear on what they need and, and who they need and, and where the shortages are. And special ed has always been one of those. And in, in, in just the, the recent times, and again, Stephanie, I'll try not to step into your area, but we've just in the last year added uh, to some of the Louisville teacher residencies and, and alt cert programs, you know, learning and behavior disorders, modern severe disabilities, we've looked at adding that, uh, as well as early childhood programs at the graduate level. So that's been kind of our more immediate focus is how do we get those folks certified and out into schools? Uh, but at the same time, we're not forgetting about the undergraduate level. We've just got a lot of work to do there because we, as, as uh, Dr. Niger said earlier, we, we've, we've seen teaching take a hit here, here recently in, in the media. Um, 
you know, it just, it's, it's been tough and it's, it's tough to get people interested in it, but we're kind of doubling down on that and, and focusing on that and, and trying to make that a, a viable option for people again as well. I mean, thank you very much. And, and Dr. Stephanie Wooden Burnett, um, you are. <laughs> well, and um, as we talk about um, those alternative certification programs and what impact does teacher preparation have on recruitment and retention and some of your efforts as the director of Alt-Cert that includes the Louisville Teacher Residency Program? Mm -hmm. um, well, everything that we do within our programs and Dr. Cooper, it's all of our programs. Um, mm -hmm. Please feel free to cross over because we all have to, because I believe it's a team effort. Um, everybody within our college working together to, to meet the school district's needs. Um, the one thing that I always try to talk about with helping recruit and retain our students is just removing barriers. Um, and it could be as simple as, you know, getting back as quickly as we can with emails. Um, I try to explain to students, you know, we have lives too. So you might email us and it might take us um, a day or two to get back with you because we have families also, but just trying to be as responsive as we can. Um, you know, really focusing on the residency program, the Louisville Teacher Residency Program, it's just meeting the school district's need. Um, they came to us and said, hey, could you do this? And, you know, our job was to create a one-year pathway for candidates who already had a degree to get certified. And um, we did that. And then we were able to add more pathways. And just watching the work that our colleagues there put into the students in the classroom with the mentor teachers from the principals creating PLCs. They have coaches. It's a, um, they've created a PLC community that truly supports the candidates once they graduate. And then on our side, we do the best that we can to, with the courses, making sure that they're available at the right times. We don't want to uh, put too much on them because it, it is an extensive one-year program, but really many of the needs of the candidates, the principals, the school districts, and everything else. Um, just like Dr. Cooper said, we were able to add, the first year we had elementary and middle and secondary content areas. Um, then this past year, we were able to add IECE and LBD in this so upcoming- for, for the audience who doesn't know what IECE right. is. And, All of our acronyms. Yes, yes I'm sorry. <laughs> IECE is the interdisciplinary IECE mm -hmm. um, early childhood education, LBD. Um, Justin, you could jump in at any time. <laughs> Learning behavior <laughs> disorder and MSD mild severe disorder. Yes, um, L LBD is learning and behavior disorders. Yeah. MSD is moderate to severe disabilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so now this up, so this upcoming year, because we started recruitment for the program now, it's going to be MSD and also world language. So we also have Spanish and French that we're going to be recruiting. Um, and we are, we are in it to win it. And we have a goal and we hope to meet our goal um, with the folks that we've got coming in. So overall, really, it's just removing barriers and each day, it, it could be something different. It um, A while ago, it was the Praxis Core for some of the candidates. And we worked together as a collective group um, to have that removed for graduate students. Um, now it's just meeting them where they're at. We are having going to have a recruitment um, event. We're going to go out into the schools and recruit. Um, we're going to have them come to campus, just getting everybody re-familiar with um, campus coming, seeing face to face, um, any and every idea that we can come up with, we're going to try to attempt to just remove any barrier that's there for anybody who wants to be a teacher. Thank you very much. And that's one of the questions was, how have we modified curriculum and instruction and assessment um, to meet the needs of the various school districts? And <clears throat> you highlighted a few of them. Um, um, Dr. Flint, Dr. Cooper, are there any other modifications that have been made to uh, deal with, this, with, the, with the numbers that we are addressing right now in the needs of the school districts? 
Um, well, I would say that a, a couple of things that we've done, recognizing who the students are that are coming into uh, teaching and learning pathways. We are now offering more courses in the later afternoons so that students can, you know, take these courses, particularly if we have folks who are coming off of UPS uh, third shift. We're trying to think about removing the barrier of sleep as something that they actually need. And so we're offering coursework at different times. We're also um, innovating in terms of our online offerings, our hybrid offerings, really thinking about uh, more flexibility for students. Yeah, and I, I will just add to that just a little bit that we, uh, Dr. Flint and uh, and I and many others met just yesterday, and we have some ongoing meetings where we're looking at restructuring our program in a much larger sense to be more uh, conducive and responsive to student needs. Um, we and, and then this all ties together. I mean, we're talking about recruitment, retention, student success, making students be successful. And, and, and looking at what we can do on a lot of different fronts, you know, to make that happen. And um, part of that is looking at what we're, what we've been doing and what we can do differently. And I do want to applaud Dr. Niger as well, because he's taken a very uh, analytical approach and looked at analytics and he's using data to kind of support, you know, what we do and let us know, you know, here are the classes that maybe we want to consider adjusting uh, based on numbers and where we've seen students struggle. So we're really taking a very um, academic approach, mm -hmm. but also a very human approach. And, and, and I think we're trying to find the middle ground there, you know, and everything from, as Dr. Flint said, looking at sleep, we know we've got students that haven't slept all night because they've worked all night coming to classes in the morning. So what can we change on that front? And then analytically looking at where we maybe are falling short and what we can do to adjust classes and make, make a better student experience. So I think we're being very reflective and very thoughtful in what we are, are trying to do with our programs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and Dr. Powers, um, as we um, not only talking about teachers, but also we know that with administrators, you know, um, there's been a mass exit of administrators as well. What are we doing? Do we know what the numbers are and how we are addressing um, the, the critical shortage that's happening um, in ed leadership as well? Well, that's an interesting question because the target changes every year. Um, Pre-pandemic, we had administrators really struggling with the um, high stakes accountability era that we had placed so much pressure on their shoulders, as well as the um, school improvement program from 2009, 2010, where the only person who could be held accountable for a low performing school during those initial years was, was the principal. They could be removed based on um, low performance of their, of their students on assessments. And so what we've done is move into a asset mindset. Um, we are working directly with, with different districts to create what we're calling um, ULEAD cohorts, and that stands for University of Louisville Education Administra Administration Degree. And so we have a ULEAD cohort for Jefferson County, which is really focusing on the middle school. They have replaced, um, this is a staggering number, either 12 or 14 middle school principals in the last 18 months, either through retirement or reassignment. And they've really um, just annihilated their bench of you know, people ready to take the next step. So we're working with them to build a cohort that we're launching in January to help them rebuild their bench. We're also working with Oldham Bullet and Shelby to do the same sort of thing, do another U lead cohort with them. And we've had a very successful one in Carrollton, their superintendent recognized that they had no one in the district who had administrative certification. So they approached us about coming up to Carrollton, this is pre-pandemic, coming up to Carrollton and teaching to eliminate that travel piece. So we did that for a few semesters and then the pandemic hit and we moved it to an online virtual platform. And um, we've gotten very creative with how we support our students in that particular cohort. Um, the business community was made aware that there was a shortage of leadership. So they proffered a $5,000 scholarship for each student that was split up $1,000 a semester. And then the Board of Education said, you know, we'll match that. And so in each of those two cohorts, we had five students who applied for those scholarships and were granted them. So their local community saw the importance of supporting the school district in that way. And it's been phenomenal work. Two of those folks are already in leadership positions that have graduated and two more are um, in leadership positions, but not at the building level. So we're really excited about that sort of work, but we are critically aware of, 
of the shortages to come with people, there's a, a bubble of retirees in the next five years that will just change the face of it, of education leadership in our area. And we want to be on the cutting edge of being ready for that. And how has, um, or how have you, or have you had to change curriculum, instruction, and assessment to meet today's student? Mm -hmm. Well, in our instance, what we've done is move to a, instead of producing general leadership candidates, we're now producing candidates that our districts are calling day one ready. So when they graduate from us, they're gonna be ready to walk into their respective districts and lead according to what their districts are doing. So we're partnering and bringing in um, guest lecturers and adjuncts to work alongside of the lead instructors so that if you're a Shelby County student, you're gonna have a Shelby County instructor. If you're a Bullock County student, you're gonna have a Bullock County instructor so that when they leave us, they are ready to walk into those. They get five general courses that are good for anyone, anywhere. And then more of the instructional leadership courses are based in whichever district they are coming from at the time. So we've taken uh, great pains to do that. We're in the middle of some of that work right now. Uh, launching two new cohorts in January. So that, that's, that's been our response to date. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Dillon, um, how, as we talk about um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and sense of belonging, uh, what are some of the efforts in terms of increasing the number of students and also the number of faculty and staff at the University of Louisville in the College of Education and Human Development? Obviously, this is a really important question, um, but I want to circle back because I think it feels like this will help address this question. Dr. Flint uh, referenced well, we have to understand who our students are, and I think this is directly related to how I can answer this question. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we as a college are trying to really grasp and understand is the, the clientele that we're recruiting, the clientele that is interested in the university, um, we have to keep in mind, somebody brought up COVID. Um, this freshman class that we're working with right now on campus, they spent two and a half years of their high school experience doing what we're doing right now in a virtual setting. So one of the things I feel like as a university, as well as a college of education, human development that we've done is really tried to understand learning styles, learning modalities that students are needing. Um, and we've put that into play. And then I think understanding who your students are is also, as I said, directly related to your question, Dr. Stark, on how we're trying to uh, address an increase in our underrepresented minority students. Um, can we do better? Of course we can. Every institution could say that. Um, it clearly our society, we can all do better to try to get more uh, underrepresented minority students holding a college degree. Um, and that's something that I know our college does not take lightly. So how are we trying to address it? One of the things we've tried to do is the program that Dr. Stephanie Wynn Burnett is leading, and we've had great success with that, obviously. Um, from an undergraduate standpoint, a program that we have shown tremendous growth in is our dual credit pathways program. And for those of you on the call who aren't familiar with that, that is taking the college experience into the local high schools. And by local, I'm saying in the state of Kentucky um, and having students earn dual credit. So they're completing high school coursework as well as college coursework. And right now for fall 22, we have 20 schools in the state of Kentucky that are partnering with us. That is an opportunity to not only uh, introduce the college experience to a whole new handful of students, but it is a way for us to hopefully increase um, our minority students who decide to attend the University of Louisville. And on when we talk about the dual credit, um, I'm a numbers guy, so I wanted to throw one in there. So I'm proud to say fall 22, we're up um, almost 34% in dual credit enrollment as compared to a fall of 19. So you can see there's been tremendous growth and it's trying to be strategic and finding partners out in the K-12 system who are willing to work with us. 
I think that's one of our great assets, um, having them, our partners in the K-12 system, help us recruit, help us get students motivated for college. And then I'd be remiss, Dr. Stark, to not include our minority teacher recruitment program as well. Um, that is a strategic program that will continue to help increase the number of minority teacher candidates. Uh, we've had great success with that over the years. And now with an infusion of trying to infuse resources into it, I'm confident it's going to uh, increase numbers as well in that. Okay, um, thank you very much. And, and, and I like to pose that question to everyone because we know that it's all hands on deck. Um, it's not any one particular person that has to, that, that shoulders the responsibility, you know, of recruitment and especially recruiting a diverse population. So for, I'm just, we can go around the table and we can start with um, Dr. Debbie Powers and, and go to Justin and whatever. It's, how, what are we doing uh, specifically to recruit um, individuals of color in our programs? So we've, actually always enjoyed a pretty diverse population in our program. So we were happy about that. But building on that, we we rely on word of mouth and excellence of program. And we've done a fantastic job. Our, our previous cohorts were in the numbers range of 12 to 17. And our last two EDD cohorts topped, topped 20. I thought my colleagues were going to just send me packing with 22 students in each cohort. But that's where we were um, this past time we enrolled students not only from this area but we have students from the Nashville area Michigan we've got a whole group out of Lexington that's joined us kind of as a study group they've joined our, our EDD cohort um, in terms of our EDS which is our building level principal and supervisor of instruction graduate degree um, those students are coming at, from uh, recommendations from our partner districts and so they're recruiting on our behalf to work within those U lead cohorts that I'd mentioned previously. Um, we make great use of social media, we host online information sessions as well, um, but frankly our reputation right now having reworked our both of our program designs in the last two years, um, our reputation is improving and we are getting students that we never thought to reach out to before. So we've moved from the Louisville area where you had to come to campus to go to class to now, you know, we have a student in Michigan and a student in Nashville this time that we're thrilled about. So we've, we've worked really hard, but um, we are gonna to continue to make use of our partner districts, I think, in working to recruit the very best for our programs. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Flint. Um, so specifically, I want to go back to uh, Dylan's comment with the multicultural teacher uh, recruitment retention program that we are so fortunate to have Whitney Taylor be the director of, and she has just recently stepped into that role, but she is a ball of fire, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, she has so many really great ideas around connecting our BIPOC students with um with faculty in the districts, with professionals in the district, and really building a professional mentorship to add to this professional support that we, I think, do really well here at the University of Louisville. So really drawing on Whitney's expertise and enthusiasm, I think is one, one of the strategies that we are, we are using, at least in the elementary, middle, secondary program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Dr. Pooper? Yeah, I'll just uh, I'll hit a couple of different areas here. I, I, my department, I think um, we've been doing pretty well at the graduate level and especially at the doctoral level and getting diverse applicants, diverse students. Um, for us, where we have to really focus our efforts more, I think right now is at the undergraduate level. And for me, I think that means, again, kind of getting back to this idea of meeting the students where they are. And by that, I mean getting out and, and getting into the schools. And that's going to be our approach. Uh, here in the near future, we're trying to build some uh, some pathways where we can get into schools and talk to potential teachers, potential educators. And I think if we get out into the metro area and get out in those schools and meet students on their ground and let them know, you know, the teaching is a great thing. Mm -hmm. I think we're I think by doing that, we know we have a diverse population of students in the schools and we know we have diverse students who have expressed interest in being teachers. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know that we're doing a good job of nurturing that interest right now. And I want to get out in the schools, talk to them from an early stage, maybe when they're sophomores, juniors, not wait until they're seniors. And, and if they express any interest in, in the teaching profession, whether that's in special education, my area or some other area, I want to you know get out and talk to them and, and pull them in. I do think that will help with uh, diverse student recruitment. Um, I also wanted to hit one other thing you mentioned uh, faculty and staff, mm -hmm. and and that's been an area that we've we've struggled in in my department in the past. And so we're doing a search right now. And one of the things that we're doing is um, we've we've paid extra money to put ads out into a, the the Chronicle for Higher Ed, for example, has what they call a diversity boost, where if you you purchase this as part of the ad process for advertising for a position, uh, they market that out to specific listservs, specific uh, uh, organizations where you're more likely to find diverse candidates. And so we're trying to do everything we can along those paths. Um, it remains to see how successful we'll be with that, but it's something that we take very seriously and that we're, we're working very hard uh, to try to increase both incoming faculty and staff um, you know, that are diverse. We're just, we're, we're really working on that right now. That's something that we, we take very seriously. And we talk to our search committees about that um, and make sure that uh, we have somebody from every search committee that's uh, from the college diversity committee, for example. So we're making a very concerted effort in that area, too. So I don't want to I know the, the primary focus is on teacher recruitment, but it's important that we also uh, have a diverse faculty and staff uh, in our college as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'd just like to say that um, um, I'm the, the treasurer on the board of directors of the National Alliance of Black School Educators. And we do have a listserv that we can be able to put that information on that listserv. Um, in fact, we have a conference that's coming up in November. So we'll definitely be, um, be open to sharing that information with me so that I can be able to share it with them to put it out there so that, uh, again, as, a, as I stated, we need all hands on deck. And so I'm willing to be able to, um, to bring that to the organization to be able to put that out there so we can have a diverse pool of candidates you know, for these positions. Yeah. Perfect. I, I will get you that position description tomorrow. Okay. Me too. <laughs> I also have a search going on, so I will send that information to you. Okay. No problem. Like I said, that's why we have these conversations because sometimes we don't know the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing or what we are doing, you know, collectively, what we're doing individually that can be able to help and assist um, and be for the you know, for the good of all. And as you mentioned about the um, recruiting at the high school level. Um, when I was in JCPS, I was MTRP coordinator in the district. And yes, it was for high school, but also we went to middle schools as well. And one of the things that we did was initially the college business was just for high schools. But I'm like, wait a minute, let's go further than that. And so I shared with them, I want to be able to bring the middle school students to college campuses. And they allowed me to be able to do that. And just to see the expressions on, the, on their faces was just exhilarating. And not only the students, but also the parents, because then the parents begin to think, oh my God, my child can attend the University of Louisville, you know, and, and on their campus and various other colleges that we went to, but putting that spark in early enough before they make a decision on, on the why not, or before they get clouded into, you know, why not teaching. So um, those are opportunities that we can be able to begin early on. And then one of my colleagues in Lexington, they went as far as going to elementary schools. So it's not, it's never too early to plant the seed, you know, of education because as they go along, then they begin to, because we all have played school, you know, and have all want to be the teacher, you know, and so at some point they get this one or just dis, disenchanted. So that's what we can do to keep the enthusiasm going. So that's, that's the key point. So we don't have to just look at high school. We can also go, go further than that to be able to begin planting those seeds. Um, Dylan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Dr. Stark, I think you brought up a great point there. And one of the things, uh, the college that we've done just recently, we were been able to hire an undergraduate recruiter. And actually their first week was just last week. So um, this individual is exactly, gonna be doing exactly what you're talking about. We're gonna be going into the schools and creating partnerships and, selling the amazing things that the College of Education and Human Development is doing. Higher ed is this unique model that um, before the influx or before the increase, I should say, of 
the internet. And as Dr. Powers said, now with teaching classes online, you can have students from all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but before that was a thing, we were really recruiting geographically. And uh, you kind of knew what your market was. Now, if you have courses that are online, the sky is, it's open borders. You know, you can have a student who, like I know in my old department in health and sports sciences, we had military personnel in the far east and they would be taking their classes while all of us here in Louisville were asleep. And it worked. And that's the amazing thing about it. So I think now with, there's more competition and then there are also less students that are going to higher education because there's so many high paying jobs right now mm -hmm. um, that it's gonna require us to have a, pre more, a stronger presence in the K-12 schools. And then like you alluded to Dr. Stark, starting even earlier than the high school level. Students sometimes already by that second year of high school already have made a decision. Um, so it's gonna be important to establish those partnerships earlier and earlier and let them understand that college is a viable option for them. Because one of the things in, in working in the human resources for a number of years, I encountered so many people who went and got degrees in other areas and what they indicated was that I always want to be a teacher. I always want to be a teacher, but just got um, disenchanted, distracted because someone was saying, no, you don't want to become a teacher. And so they ended up coming back, you know, to become a teacher. Um, and they had to go through, you know, certification, all sorts programs and different things in some way, which I would always share with them that you're not here to be a long-term sub. That's not, you have, you can do more than that. But again, we do have individuals, you know, and even across the campus, across the college, the university that, can become teachers. We just have to let them know that we want them and that um, there's a market for them and we need them you know, as well. Uh, in talking about what we need and, and let's talk about some of the things we have done, some of our successes. Um, as we talk about the Louisville Teacher Residency Program, um, Dr. Stephanie Wooden Burnett, can you share with the audience just some of the, the great things that have happened and the numbers that we've been able to see as a result of the Louisville Teacher Residency Program? Well, I'll say this, the success for the program, it's, I was trying to list out all of the people, um, but, you know, Miss Selena Fishback, she, on the JCPS side, has really ran and taken with the, um, the support for the candidates, um, the coaches, um, uh, Miss Angela Gafori, um, Miss Smith, from the mentor teachers, and there's too many mentor teachers to list because there's, I could, but that would take all day. Um, from the principals at the different schools um, to just the PLCs with the cohort members, what they've done is created a accurate, beautiful organization for how to support the candidates through the one-year program from the, from the summer, um, it's very clear what they do fall, spring, and they take their summer classes to graduation to the praxis support that they found that best supports the candidates. Um, it's, it's just like a, it, now it's a well oiled machine. Now we're sitting back and really enjoying um, the candidates as they um, are their first year, second, third year teaching. Um, and then, you know, just from the U of L side, uh, Brandon Gossett is our main recruiter and he is outstanding. Um, he works very closely with the folks at JCPS with Selena. Uh, they also have a new uh, recruiter. His name is Mr. Craig Floyd. Just with the expertise that's with all of those people to get the candidates um, into the program. And the success is we've been really we've been able to dig down into our processes and figure out what's working and what's not working. Well, if it's not working, what are we going to do and how are we going to do it together? Um, we had a meeting earlier this week and the ideas that were flowing, it's, it's, it, to me, it's just magic uh, about what we're going to be able to do for um, number three, you know, the programs at UofL, um, you know, number two, you know, just within JCPS, but number one, our vision and mission is kids and just seeing what we're going to be able to do for kids in the classroom. Um, I hope that everybody sees it and, 
and can see to see all the hard work that we're all doing. Um, the successes we've got people that are in and they're learning, they're growing, um, and they are they're going out. First year, we had I think it was around twenty nine candidates. Second year, I feel like it was thirty two. This year, we're back up to thirty five. Our goal this year um, is let's say fifty to sixty. Who knows? Um, because the recruiters on both of our sides are phenomenal. I wouldn't be surprised if there was seventy. Um, well, you know what our goal is, right? You know, Dr. Polio and I still, you know, we stay with what the goal is, right? Dr. Polio, um, he said he'd like to have a hundred, and yes, sir, we will do that. Um, because of because of the hard work on both sides, and especially, like I said, I can't speak enough about the 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 support that's being provided to the candidates within school from the coaches and JCPS. Um, it's just. I'm halfway speechless because there's so many things that I could talk about there. Um, but the success is, like I said, we've been really able to dig in and figure out what's, what's going good and what's not going good. Um, one of the things that I really do like to kind of boost Brandon about is when we do transcript review for some of the candidates, some of them, they might not have all the content or the courses that they need. Brandon has done a really good job at um, connecting with those people and making sure that they, we stay with them. We help them figure out where can they take those courses. So now we're not just seeing people, we're not just saying yes or no, we're saying yes, here's the pathway. No, not right now. Mm -hmm. And so we're starting to see more candidates being able to come into the pipeline that Brandon's been working with. Uh, for the past year or two years, those folks are starting to actually apply to the program now. And that's where the boost is. And then I do think that that really does help um, with all the candidates, letting them know that we're we're not going to say no and then just turn our back. We're going to we're going to say not right now, but here's how we're going to help you. And that's the word of mouth. Um, I've had a couple of students who their parents graduated from a different program. And now their, their sons and daughters are applying to the residency program. So that's, that's our boots on the ground. Um, and how do I work with these folks? I go schools, in my opinion, it's where it's at. That's where we learn how to teach. And so if I go into the schools where the people are um, and just ask questions, how can I help you? Um, they'll, they'll start calling. Um, I think I have two phone calls right now. Uh, I just, they just popped up on my email. So I'll get back with those people tomorrow. And that is the key is that being able to forge those relationships and with individuals, uh, the kids, because we can't do it. Well, there's a best of interest in, for both of us, you know, for the university and also, you know, for our community, um, because um, universities should be manufacturers of hope. Uh, and, and that's what we should be in the business of doing. And sometimes our community members don't have that hope. And so it's upon us to be able to let them know that we do want you here and we'll find a way for you to be successful here. Yeah. And with that being said, I mean, Dr. Um, Powers, you've done a, an amazing job with, with, with looking at the various cohorts. And, and so what are some of the things I know right now, um, you're working with JCPS on, on the Wallace Grant and equity-centered leaders. You know, talk to the audience about what does that mean you know, and also what those cohorts are, what that means for the individuals or the leaders that we're going to have walking into school buildings, as you say, as you say, the day ready. Yeah, so what we're what we've done, we're working with um, Jefferson County Public Schools as their research one university partner in the Wallace Foundation's uh, equity centered pipeline initiative. So year one was all about self study, taking a look at what programming we currently have but we had to look at it through the lens of equitable practices. So equity, access, opportunity, and our program was designed only two years ago, but through the lens of continuous improvement because that's that was the focus at the time. So what we've done is a really deep, a deep and contextual self-study about everything from our admissions process to how we recognize our graduates um, in all points in between. So curriculum assessment, pedagogy, admissions, how we handle that, 
how we handle student support throughout a program. So it, it's focusing on our certification program for principal and supervisor of instruction. But in year two, it's now bleeding over into our superintendent program, our director of special ed program, as well as our EDD, because we built a logic model to work with uh, Jefferson County through the Wallace Foundation for a five-year project. And so those programs are also a part of it in terms of advanced certifications. So it's everything from the materials we're choosing in, in our courses to who's teaching them. Uh, we are using and deeply embedding the Jefferson County equity dispositions that they have identified. So we are being very responsive partners. And in those districts outside of Jefferson, you know, um, Jefferson has a pillar that they, they espouse to that is racial equity. So in our other districts that we're working with, it's not so much racial equity, but other types of equity. And so we're looking at those program designs through the lens that is best gonna serve those districts. And again, meeting people where they are, you know, and what their needs are and not being a cookie cutter or a one size fits all. It's meeting the audience or the, the constituents where they are, which is um, what's needed and necessary. Um, Dr. Dillon, um, Anything else that's in moving forward, um, any things that you see for, for the University of Louisville in terms of how do we get there and, and, and just some of the, the, the systems or things that, that you think our audience should know to know that, why choose U of L? And that's the question for everyone, why choose U of L? Well, I think the biggest thing is you're more than a number to us. Uh, there's a story for each individual student. And I take uh, great joy in learning the story and trying to help them reach their end goal, whatever that might be. And that might not be for them to be a K-12 teacher. That might not even be for them to be a college graduate. Uh, student success looks different for every individual person. And I think it's important in our industry that we remember that um, and remember that each and every one of us on this call has a different story of how we got to where we are today. And it's important to understand that when we're meeting prospective students, it's important that you understand that uh, when you look out and you're standing at your podium talking in the middle of your lecture, um, there's variables at hand that are impacting the student success. And it's not losing sight of that. Um, I really think what Dr. Wooden Burnett said about not answering no right away is a perfect example of that. Um, would it be easier to say, no, you're not eligible? Sure, it would be easier. But the reality of the situation is that individual has a desire to want to try to do this. So we need to figure out as an institution how to help them reach their goals. And that's what I feel strongly that's what we're doing right now in the College of Education and Human Development is meeting the students where they are and trying to help them reach their end goal. Um, so that's the way we're approaching our recruiting. That's the way the narratives that we're trying to have with department leadership and well as faculty that this is a team effort. I've heard that stated multiple times on this call today. Um, it's more than one person can ha handle, and it's not one person's not going to be successful with this. Everyone at the University of Louisville, from uh, physical plant workers to the upper administration, have to be involved and understand their role in helping students succeed. I was at a admissions event in, um, about a month ago, and our, our executive director of admissions gave this great story and talked about a family that came up to her and said they chose University of Louisville. And our executive director asked, well, what made you choose? And she said, my son and I were walking across campus and we were lost and a physical plant worker stopped and talked to us for 15 minutes. And they said that right then and there is when we realized the university was where we wanted our child to go. It's those moments. You don't know when it's going to happen. You know, after I walk out of this meeting and I'm headed to the parking garage to head home, there may be a student that stops. And I'll look at my watch and say, do I have time for this? My answer needs to be yes, I have time for this. Because you never know that what that moment could mean for that student. And you can't take lightly what we're doing in higher education. 
we're changing their trajectory, their children's trajectory. It's an amazing thing. And we, we, as an institution, that's what I think we're doing really well. Very good, thank you. Um, Dr. Amy Sealy Flint, why you will? Well, from a <laughs> elementary, middle, secondary perspective, one of the um, selling points that I think we have is the robust nature of our field experiences. We haven't mm -hmm. talked much about that, but we really um, invest a lot of energy and time in making sure that our students who are pursuing teaching and learning pathways have lots of experiences in classrooms, K-12 classrooms across the district. And we, I think we do a really good job of scaffolding those experiences for students. So they start off with some um, observation kinds of activities, small group work activities, and over the course of their teacher ed program, they move into much more complex and longer periods of time where they are then becoming the student teacher and things like that. We, um, our students have, I can't even tell you, 400 plus hours by the time they're done, just in their field experiences alone. And it's those moments where thinking about the students coming with individual stories, they all have experiences, of course, of being students themselves. And so they get to really see a wide variety of what classrooms look like. And um, so that's one thing. And the other um, piece I would I will say is building on um, Dylan's comments that yes, every student comes with a story. And one of the things I think we do well too is we think about the pathway to their goal. So not only is it the um, the smaller um, micro moment interactions but we have been very thoughtful about the programming that we offer. And so we have lots of pathways for folks who want to be teachers, whether they're coming as undergraduates, they're coming as graduate students, they're coming with a couple of courses here and there, what can they do? We have a pathway to being a teacher. And so I think that's another strong, um, strong aspect about UofL. And one last thing mm -hmm. is we have, um, we also, recognize that we not only have a really amazing academic advising center and the, uh, the, the academic advisors who do an amazing job of figuring out schedules and helping students sort of plan out their course and their flight plans, but we also have faculty mentors. And so we have the ability for the student to get some advice and support on their coursework but then they also have opportunities to engage with faculty in one-on-one -on -one situations and in small groups to learn more about what the profession is bringing, what they can do once they step into the classroom. So helping them think about their lifelong professional goals is something that I think we offer as well. So thank you very that's, much. That's what I'll say. <laughs> hey, um, Dr. Cooper, why are you available? Well, I think of a couple of things. I think, of, first of all, I, I would echo what everyone has said to this point. Um, but I also think about, you often hear Louisville, the city, described as kind of a big little city or a big city that feels really small, um, has a smaller feel to it. I, I feel like our campus and, and our university is much like that. I think students that come to our university have kind of get the best of both worlds. They feel like they're in a smaller program. They're gonna have classes with faculty that are out doing research. And, and if you're not familiar, there's a variety, kind of a spectrum of different types of universities, some that do no research and some that do almost nothing but research and then everything in between. And, and the University of Louisville is a good combination of that. We've got some of the leading researchers. I can only speak for special education. and I'm sure the other folks can speak for their areas. We've got some of the top researchers in the area of special education who are also, you know, they're conducting research on a daily basis. And they may be the person that's gonna come in and teach your undergraduate class. Um, and that's, that's very common. That's not common at other universities. I know that for a fact. And so I think you get a really good experience here. You're gonna have some top, level researchers that might get undergraduates as well as graduates involved in that research. So you can have that experience, mm -hmm. um, but you're also gonna have, for the most part, very small classes, class sizes. 
and you get kind of that, that more personal touch that you might get at a smaller university. I really feel like we do a really good job of, of bridging those two worlds and giving students a really good experience. The only other thing I'll say is that, and this kind of echoes what others have said, um, we have a very caring faculty. We care about you as a person. You're not a number to us. You are a human being who is interested in being a teacher and, and all of the things that comes, comes with that. Um, that, that that's more than just you know your academics we look at you as a person we want you to be successful um, emotionally socially academically across the board and I do believe that that our faculty really care about that and, and we try to work very hard to give students that kind of experience that lets them know that you belong here and we're going to help you to be successful um, and I and, and again I'm not sure that you get that everywhere and I wouldn't put other universities down I can only speak to what I know and what I see and what we do here. And I feel really good about most of what we do here. Um, and I, and I, I think we can give students a really good experience here. Thank you very much. And Naiba, um, I was talking to someone yesterday and um, JCBS and they mentioned that the, some of the two critical areas were special ed and early childhood. And I know a number of years ago, maybe five, 10 years ago, um, you will have a specific program with JCPS for early childhood. And so maybe that can be something that can be revisited to see how that can happen specifically, because even at one point when there was an ESL need, U of L had a specific partnership with JCPS to make sure that that happened. And so that can be an opportunity to be able to also address the need that's there with early childhood and special ed, special education. So that's just something to, to share with you. Um, Dr. Wooden Burnett, um, why are you a bell? Well, I'm biased completely. Um, yeah, because you have three degrees from there. I have three <laughs> degrees. I've been around since the fall of 1999 as a student mm -hmm. athlete. So, um, and I tell everybody that I'm completely biased when I talk to students about why U of L or people about why U of L. Um, but why? I'm, um, I loved it so much I stayed mm -hmm. because of the faculty, um, just like everybody is saying, the faculty, you know, kind of like Dylan is saying, I would see some of my professors just walking around on campus and it's like, hey, I got a question about this. Okay, let's have it sit, let's talk about this. Mm -hmm. Um, that that hasn't changed um, since I was here before to now. And now I'm one of those people that get to do um, that. I do think that with the ideas that we're coming up with, that we're thinking about, that we are um, from department to part, from department to department, figuring out how we can work together. Um, you know, just with the Alt Cert program and the residency programs, it's you know all of us are working together on this, and we're seeing the benefits of that. Um, then from working with advising, there's different options that are coming out. Um, I know there's the option nine that we get a lot of questions about, and that's a that's for everybody as we work together again. So in working with the school districts, um, it's it is a caring place. We do the best that we can. Um, for me, when I make a mistake, I try to say I'm sorry. I won't do it again. How can we make it better? And then I fix it. And then we keep on going. And I think that's um, just the mentality that a lot of us take with, with our students and within our courses, figuring out what needs to change and not letting anything slow us down uh, to keep us moving forward. I'm a real boots on the ground type person. So um, I like the action. If somebody says something, okay, what can we do? What, how can we uh, make it better? Thank you very much. And, and Dr. Powers, um, again, why you will, and again, as we are, you know, over the years, you know, right now we have so many different programs throughout the city, um, or throughout the county that people are vying and, and pulling, you know, for individuals, and there's other, there's competition, um, so share with the audience, you know, why you will. I think one of the things that stands out, I completely agree with everything my colleagues have said, I don't know that I could add much more, we're very personalized. Mm -hmm. Um, I know my students well, all of us do. We know when there's struggles. I, I'm a practitioner, not a researcher necessarily. I'm clinical faculty. So I understand the rhythm of a school year when we're dealing with people who are, are aspiring administrators. 
So we're very in tune with that in terms of, you know, what their life feels like, but we also are caretakers of our community at large. So we have things like the signature partnership where we have partnerships with different schools in Jefferson County, everyone from the Kent School of Social Work to the medical school to the College of Education. And I think that because we are partners in the community, it, it helps, as Dr. Cooper was saying, it, it's, it makes our little university feel big, our big university feel small. It brings a sense of community and home to what we do because we are caretakers in the community as well. And I think that's an important um, aspect of what we do at UofL that sets us apart from some of our other folks in the in the region. And um, and speaking about caretakers, you know, mental health, you know, is a, a big challenge not only for students but also for adults as well. Um, what are we doing, and what can we do, um, Dr. Dillon? How can we? Um, what are we doing, and what can we do to to salvage that? Because we know right now there's a lot that's going on in our society and there's a burden that all of us carry. So how, what are we doing to help and assist not only students, but also um, faculty uh, with mental health? Yes, you're absolutely right. This is an issue that has definitely increased over the last two and a half years with the outbreak of COVID and people going virtual, uh, losing that connection with people. Um, so we're definitely seeing that with our students. So the university as a whole, we have uh, many mechanisms in place to try to help uh, provide resources and access to mental health professionals um, with campus health and um, our mental health counselors on campus. But more importantly, I think now is a chance for me to brag about something our college is specifically doing that's, un that's unique. Uh, we're, we're not doing, and no one else on campus is doing it. And that what, that, what I'm referencing is we have our own mental health professional um, actually in my office suite area that we have downstairs on the first floor and the undergraduate advising and student development office. So we have a pr trained professional who is available to meet with faculty, staff, and students. And this really came about um, as a result of the increased demand that we were seeing at the university by our students um, and having delays in getting access to appointments because there was so such high demand. So as an institution, but more specifically as a college, we said, you know what, what can we do? How can we approach this differently? And it was to flip the script and say, well, let's bring a professional in-house. And the amazing thing that I've been able to see firsthand in this role that I'm in now is a student can be meet, meeting with one of our trained academic advisors, and they're mo more than an academic advisor. That's the title they are, but they're far more than that. They're really a life coach um, and a support mechanism for our students. But they can have a session with that advisor, and that's really where the student starts to feel comfortable and tell, peeling back the layers of that onion, so to speak, of what's going on in their life. You know, it's one thing to see, you can look at a transcript or you can look at a report and say, well, a student's doing poorly in class, but there's a reason they're doing poorly in class. And often the student is too afraid to have that discussion with a faculty member. Um, they often have that with their advisors. And now the beauty of this model is the advisor can say, well, have you thought about meeting with our mental health professional? And they're like, no, can you introduce me? And then we walk them right down the hall. And instead of saying, here's a phone number, call them, there's that introduction. And that breaks down the barrier. And then it allows the student to feel comfortable to have those challenging conversations. I think it's worked wonders for our college. Um, and it's, again, it's more than just for students. It's available for staff, it's available for faculty. Um, but the part I'm the most excited about is the fact that it's giving us, our students access to resources um, in a more timely manner. Um, so I'm, I'm really proud about that. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Amy Seely Flint, um, and for everyone. Um, have you seen a student? How have you addressed um, mental health um, in your area? 
Um, <clears throat> well, in, in addition to um, the wellness nook that we have on camp or in in house, I think just because we are able to offer uh, courses with um, that are smaller and more personalized, we get to know the students in, in really um, uh, more than just a student in our class, right? We 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 can see the anxiety on their face. We can hear the stress coming through in their voice. We can really attend to those um, to those issues and. We can we can also refer folks down to um, the wellness nook, and I and I think we um, because we are focused in on the personal nature of our jobs and working with folks who are going to be teachers, working with kids and families and in, in the community. I think we have a faculty that are really responsive and flexible. You know, like. It used to be that maybe we wouldn't have had that that sort of flexibility of how we might offer our course or have a little bit more of a, um, you know, you have to get your paper in on time attitude. And it's not to say that our students are not getting their papers in on time. They are. But I think there is a level of flexibility flexibility that we're offering that allows students to feel like we're all in this together. And it's not just them having an experience, but that we know how to respond to them. And so um, I would say it's that personal nature that we're able to offer. Thank you very much. Dr. Stephanie Wooden Burnett, anything like to add on mental health and, and, and where we are today with students and faculty? Just, I mean, specifically for me, what I do, um, students, if they email me or call me or text me, I show up. Um, I make certain spots during my day to where because all of my students are out in the schools and if they need something I show up I tell them I might not I can't get there tomorrow but I can get there the next day mm -hmm. and I do that or there's a phone call um, I've got students who will just say hey every other week let's do a 10 minute check-in so just being personal um, willing to listen uh, walking the students down to the wellness nook during a lot of our orientations. We invite um, her to come into the orientation. Here's her card or here's my office um, for all of that. And they've utilized that area multiple times. Also our graduate student success center, um, especially around probably around four or 4.30 when classes start for, for, for our graduate students that area is open. So I know a lot of our candidates, they go in there and get coffee, just have a time to chat, just to meet new people. Other professors are in there as well. So just in, you know, having an open door um, policy was a lot of our students has helped as well. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Cooper. I'll just add a couple things really quickly that, that we're doing. Um, First of all, we've made sure that students are aware of all of the different resources. Um, that's something I think historically college students don't necessarily know everything that's around them and, and, and available to them. So we've tried to make um, made a concerted effort to make sure that they know what's out there. We've actually even made a list of all the possible uh, resources that they might use. We've added statements to most of our syllabi in our courses to make sure that they know, you know that they can turn to us. But beyond that, I think I'll just echo uh, what uh, Dr. Seeley Flint said. Um, I th I've seen a very dramatic change in how we uh, show more empathy toward our students. And, and, we, and it's purposeful. Um, as a, a leader in my department, I, every, every single department meeting we have, we had one yesterday, I remind, remind the faculty that our students are struggling. It's different right now. We continue to be empathetic. Um, and yet still maintain standards, but we meet students where they're at and a lot of our students are struggling. So we have a lot of discussions about it um, and make sure that students know what's available to them, make sure that our faculty know what's available and make sure the faculty are being understanding. Um, we do have students that are struggling right now. And, uh, and, and I know that over the last two and a half years, Everybody in my department has become a lot more flexible, a lot more understanding, and, uh, and, and we have to do that. It's, it's a different world right now, and, uh, and these students have had a different experience than our traditional students, and, and if we want to be successful, we have to make our students be successful, and that means meeting them where they're at. 
Thank you very much, um, Dr. Powers. And again, as we talking about um, individuals who may be in aspiring leaders or maybe in, in leadership roles, you know, how do you help them or how do you identify or maybe even the, do they reach out um, regarding their mental health or what happens or how do you detect that or even uh, respond to that? I think say? everything my colleagues have said, um, we're also employing, you know, we, my program is all postmaster students. So they are working professionals in buildings every day. They're teaching and leading already in the field. And so their pressures are immense. So we have done little things like moved our start time to classes to later in the evening, especially when they were online all day. So we moved our start time so that they could have a little break from screens and, and come back and kind of refresh at that point. Um, our students are incredibly resilient. They have created their own groups within our cohorts. We're a cohort model for all of our courses. And so they've created their own groups. Um, I, I cannot tell you the number of times that my phone dings in the evening, either during or after class where someone just has a question or, hey, can you help us with this? And um, I, as Stephanie said, it's being available and showing up for your students, whether it's virtually or in person when they need you. And that's what we that's what we've had to do. And for my colleagues, what we've done is we've my group of, of faculty that we work together, adjuncts and full time, we are playing to our strengths. And if something is not your strength and you struggle with it, then we'll find someone who has that strength and they can help you with it. So we're trying to look for those complementary skill sets and be very empathetic to their needs because, you know, working professionals may have children home or a spouse or a parent who's ill as well. And so we're all facing the same things. And so I just think being in tune and in touch with um, what's going on in our students' lives as well as what's going on in our colleagues' lives in a non-threatening, non-invasive way, I think has really helped us through this, the last two and a half, three years. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm not sure if we have any questions from any, I don't see any questions in the chat, but I think we have probably done an amazing job with responding to all those questions and, and why choosing you well. But I wanna thank each and every one of you all for, for your time, for your effort, for uh, educating not only K-12, but higher ed, but our community about what is U of L doing in terms of recruitment? Because the education shortage is real, but we can do something about it if we are collectively working together. And as Dr. Powell was saying, that we all bring something to the table. So let's work with this collectively, then we can get some things done and be able to move forward in the process. So I'm going to look in this chat or in this question, see if we have any questions, but I want to, um, and I don't see anything because I think we've just have done an amazing job with. With, with making it all happen. Um, any parting words um, that anyone would like to say to the audience um, before we, uh, we have about five more minutes. So any parting words from anyone that would like to just jump in and say something. <laughs> Go cards. Give me a C, A. <laughs> uh, now someone was supposed to say the rest of that, you know? <laughs> Let me let me try it again. Give me a C. C. A. A. R. R. D. D. S. 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 Go cards. <laughs> again, um, thank you. Um, thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for, for being here today because we just never know when people say they don't know. And that's always the, the challenge uh, in our community, even in, in our institutions, when people say, well, what are they doing? You know, and we can be doing things, but no one knows what those things are. And so it's always good to be able to share this information with the community at large, or even with the, even within our, um, with, with our, within our um, college, because now I'll be receiving um, dispositions or from, from Dr. Amy Tilly Flynn and also Dr. Cooper, so that I can be able to share information with, uh, with another uh, listserv that can be able to help us bring additional candidates um, to our uh, to our college. And I guess I want to give another shout out like said so Brandon does a good job with recruitment and and Brandon um, um, does an amazing job. And so Brandon, um, can you want to say a few words about the work that you do um, because we we value you, we recognize you for what you do. And it doesn't go unnoticed. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Stark. Um, it looks like I'm having trouble getting my video turned on, but um, I'll just say that um, it, it takes a village. <laughs> it, uh, it is all hands on deck. I heard that a few times. Uh, that's been my philosophy. Uh, and we can't do it without our district partners, uh, with JC, without JCPS. We can't do it without our, our OVEC partners. Um, I know, and some of them are even on our call tonight uh, from Oldham County. Uh, for sure, I see uh, I see uh, Rich uh, grab us and uh, appreciate him attending. So, yeah, we can't do it without um, without our partners. That's for sure. Um, Stephanie said, "Boots on the ground." I agree. Uh, it, it, you've got to have that connection. You've got to be uh, in the schools. You got to have your connection to the schools. I call it, you got to have a ground game and an air game. And uh, the ground game is very much having your, your presence in the school districts part in the partners. Uh, so we, we appreciate them for sure. So thank you for, thank you for asking. I appreciate everybody being on the call today too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Powers. Um, I don't, I don't have much to add. I mean, our colleagues, this has been a great panel tonight. I really appreciate actually learning more about what we're all doing in support of all of our students um, at the University of Louisville. And, you know, I would say that um, I was just thinking when we were talking about care and care of the community, you know, we have the guiding set of cardinal principles that the university puts forth and we've adopted those in the ed leadership program and kind of uh, tweaked them a little bit to reflect what it would what that looks like as an education leader. And I would say that we lead off with a capital C of care and care for the community. And I think that's an important piece when you look at your community as maybe the people that you work with, your students, as well as the community at large. So I, I think, uh, I wanna thank everyone for being here with us this evening, but also thank the, my fellow panelists. I think we've done a wonderful job of bringing to life what it means to be a Louisville Cardinal. Absolutely, uh, and again, I was at a conference recently and, and when the, the keynote speaker meant, uh, mentioned that we have to be manufacturers of hope. It's like, wow, that just kind of resonated, you know, because we are supposed to be manufacturers of hope, you know, for our entire community. And so many times we sit in, in the midst of communities that may not be as well off as we, you know. And so with that, we have to be able to invite them in and know that they can come in but we have to do that by building those relationships and having open arms. You know, and as Dr. Stephanie Wooden Burnett stated that, um, maybe the person, you, you don't say no, you just say, let's look at how we can make it happen for you. You know, and I know Dr. Powers has done that multiple times as well with individuals who want to be in, but let's see how we can make it work. And so again, it's about being caring, being open and, and welcoming with, with warm arms to individuals and not just say, go click this button and click this website and click this, but being able to be present and being in the moment of what's happening right now, because we all are, it, it's all hands on deck. And so again, I wanna thank everyone for being here today. Thank you for saying yes um, to this. Um, and for those individuals who are, I mean, some individuals can't come, but this is always on our website. So individuals can always go back and view it. So even if you know individuals who weren't able to come but that want to view it, and it is on the nice things on the website. So thank you all and um, have a great evening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Stark, just a heads up. I think you'll have to stop the recording. You won't let me do that. Okay. Okay, I can stop it and then what? <laughs>